recently, uh, I was approached by the organizer of this event to give a talk. And you heard I have. But in one of the conversations, I asked him a question. I asked him, how long should the speech be? He said, keep it around 15 to 18 minutes. I said, okay. Really? How long are 15 minutes? Has it ever happened to you that a boring lecture seems to last so long? And your holidays and weekends pass away so quickly? Well, why does it happen? Well, it happens due to something called time perception. It's a field of study in neuroscience and psychology. And luckily, I don't know any of those. So, one second is one second, and a minute is a minute. Right? So it's time the same for everyone. But I recently I did a survey and asked this question to about 60 students. Let's see what they have to say about this. That's the question there. Do you think that one second or one minute is the same for every observer? About 90% of people think that no, it's not. Okay, that's pretty interesting one. So, why is it so? Well, this happens due to what we call special theory of relativity. So what is relativity? To answer that question, let's first ask a more fundamental question. What is motion? So how do we know that something is moving? Well, some of you might say that when you move, you feel a force, you feel a push or a pull, but that happens when you're accelerating, when your speed changes. But today, I'm only going to talk about constant speed. So we are not accelerating, we are not changing our speeds. If we are at a constant speed. So how do you know that you're moving when you're at a constant speed? Simple. Some of you might say that if you're sitting in a car, you look outside. If the trees, the roads, the buildings, they go backward, you move. Right. So what we need here is a point of reference, a frame of reference. So that's your frame of reference. So in your frame of reference, you see the buildings, the roads, and trees going backwards. So that's your frame of reference. Now, there is an observer outside the car. So what he sees is that all the buildings, the roads, and the trees, they are stationary, and you're moving. That's his frame of reference. Now, some of you might prefer his frame of reference because trees, buildings, and roads, they don't move, right? They are fixed points. So we are in a building right now. Are we moving? I would say yes, we are. I am moving right now. In fact, you all are moving right now. This building is moving right now. Why? Well, because the Earth is not flat. We live on a planet called Earth, which is tilted at about 23.4 degrees on its axis and is rotating continuously. So, you know, the way the Earth rotates on its axis, I just love it. It makes my day. Apart from that, the Earth, apart from rotating, it's going around a giant ball of gas, which we call the Sun. Okay, so now some of you might say, okay, let's take the Sun to be our fixed point. Well, actually, it's not a good idea because the sun is going around the center of our galaxy. But there is a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy called Sagittarius A star, and our sun is continuously going around that thing. Now, some of you might say, okay, let's step, take that black hole to be a fixed point. Trust me, that's not a good idea either. There are about billions of trillions, maybe even more. Nobody really knows how many galaxies are there, and they're all moving. So in other words, there is no such thing as a fixed point. You might think I'm steady right now, but I'm just going to move more than 200,000 meters. Done. With respect to the center of our galaxy. I just did that. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is no such thing as a fixed point. So the frame of reference in which we are sitting in a car and we are fixed and all the buildings are moving backwards is as true as a frame of reference in which we are moving and the buildings are stationary. So that's the first postulate of the special theory of relativity, that all frame of references are equally correct, and all laws of physics apply on them. Okay. So now moving to the second postulate of the special theory of relativity. So it's about light. So interesting thing to know about light is it is the fastest thing. So it moves at a speed about 299792458 meters per second. So what is light? That's right. So that's a photon. Light is made up of particles called photons and they move at that speed. Trust me, it's really fast. 
So the postulate states that all the observers in the universe should measure the speed of light to be the same. Okay, it sounds simple, right? But let's try to understand this thing. So to understand this, we need to go in space. So here we are. So suppose you're imagine you're on a spaceship. And you're a cat there. So with respect to the cat, you're moving at the speed of <coughs> 50 meters per second. So the, in cat's frame of reference, the cat is stationary and you're moving at 50 meters per second. All right. Now, what you do is, you throw a ball from your spaceship and the ball appears to be moving at the speed of 10 meters per second. So you see the ball to be moving at the speed of 10 meters per second. So we might think, what speed should the, of the ball should be for the cat? So the cat would see the ball to be moving at 60 meters per second, right? Because you are moving at 50 with respect to the cat and the ball is moving at the speed of 10. So 50 plus 10, that's 60. Okay. Now let's, let's go a bit faster. So there you are again, with some cool sunglasses on, because you are going at 90% the speed of light, standing on a spaceship. Okay, it's a bit absurd, but let's imagine you are doing that. You're going at 90% the speed of light, and you sit up again. Now what you do is, into the ball, you take a flashlight, and you have photons. So what speed of, what should it be the speed of photons for the cat? Well, you might say that it should be the speed of light plus your speed. Okay, let's make things a bit more interesting. Suppose the cat has a flashlight now, and the cat switches it on. So now, for cat, the speed of light is the speed of light is 100% the speed of light, and now you're already going at 90% the speed of light. So you might think that you would observe those photons to be going at 10% the speed of light, but no, that's not the thing. You and the cat both see that all photons are going at the same speed, which is c the speed of light. How does this happen? Well, clearly, there is a flaw here. And the flaw is not in a special theory of relativity. The flaw is in a perception of space and time. So, how do we calculate speed? Well, that's how we calculate speed. Speed is distance by time, right? So your problem is not with speed. Here, the problem is in a perception of distance of space and time. So let's try to measure time using the speed of light because speed of light is a constant. So to do this, let's do this. So even almost everyone can clearly see that since velocity is, or speed is distance by time, then time is distance by velocity. All right. So since we are using the speed of light, we replace it by c because it's a constant. That's the speed of light, that's why it belongs. All right, to do this, you need something called a time clock. There it is. It's, sim it's a simple uh, structure. They are just two mirrors with their reflecting surfaces facing each other. And we set them uh, on such a distance that when a photon goes from top to bottom and comes back, it's a second. OK, so that's a photon. And let's call this distance s. That's a photon. It goes down, comes back. That's a second. So that's how we define a second from now. Now let's do something interesting. Let's move the, our time clock. Here we go. Well, okay, but this is the path of the photon this time. This path is longer than last time. And to prove this, let's call this S dash. Now you can clearly see that S dash is longer than S. Well, because hypotenuse is the longest side in a right angle triangle, right? So it's clearly the longest side here. And so that distance is greater than the distance it covered earlier. Okay, now we know this thing. Now let's divide both of them by C because it's a constant. Everyone knows that much math, right? That you, if you divide something by the same thing, it, the relationship still holds. That part is still greater than but the right hand side. But now, we just noticed that distance divided by the speed is nothing but time. Here it is. And this distance was when in a, in a 
second. So basically what we are saying here by t dash is greater than t is that one second is greater than one second. So when you when your speed is higher, your seconds become longer. So one second becomes longer when you are going faster. This phenomenon is called time dilation. Now often time, this also affects length. So when you go at high speeds, lengths become shorter. They contract for you. So if you're going at really high speed, people would see you to be at to be contracted, to be shorter. So if there is a train which is approaching us as suppose 80% of the speed of light, we would see the train to be shorter. It would still be as tall as it is, it would still be as wide as it is, but it would be shorter and compressed. Now again let's go in space. So we are in our spaceship now and we are going at about 80% of the speed of light and we are approaching Earth. So now in our frame of reference, what we will see is that Earth is coming towards us, right? Because if you go somewhere, what you see is the things come towards you. So now we are seeing Earth coming towards Earth. So what happens is that we see Earth getting shorter. It will affect its distance from top to bottom and left to right. So what basically we would see is a disk. So if you go faster and faster and faster and faster, more than 99% of the speed of light, there would be a speed where the Earth would just be this wide, or maybe even less. Depends on your speed. This is length contraction. Now you would say that, okay, we just see the Earth to be that way. It's not really getting that way. Actually, let's go back to the first postulate of special theory of theory. It says that all frame of references are equally correct. So in a frame of reference in which you are stationary and seeing the Earth to be a big giant ball, as to as the frame of reference in which you are seeing the Earth to be like it is, but still not good reason to support the flat Earth theory. Okay. After this, there 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 appears to be paradox here. How? Well, let's come back to Earth and let's write the frame. So we need. So here we have a tunnel in a frame. So what you can clearly see here is that the frame is much longer than the tunnel. And it won't, won't completely fit inside the tunnel. Okay. When, it's, it, when it's at rest, when it's stationary, it would not completely fit inside the tunnel. But we just learned about length contraction. So what if this train is going at, again, 80 or 90% of the speed of light? Uh, there's an observer outside who's looking at all this. So to him, what would appear is something like this. The pain would fit inside that tunnel because the lens get contracted. Okay, but what about the person who's sitting inside the pain? Well, he sees the tunnel approaching him. So what he sees is that the pain still does not fit, and instead the tunnel gets shorter. Okay, well these are different perspectives from different frame of references. So now what the guy who's standing outside does it? He puts in two bulletins on both the ends of the tunnel. Bulletins, they're like jokes. They go, go down and come up. So if the train is louder, we would chop the train off. Those are two bulletins on the two sides of the tunnel. So this guy who's outside, what he sees is that the train fits inside and so the train should not break because it fits inside completely. So that's what he, he thinks would happen. But in the frame of reference of the person who is inside the train, do you think this would happen? Would the train break then? So would it happen that the train would break for one person and would not break for the other? No. Things that happen, events which happen, happen for everyone. So either the train would break or it would not break. So we can't say that, so which frame of reference is true? So is it that one frame of reference is true and other is false? No. The train would not break, that's the answer to this paradox. Well, but for the person who is standing outside, that's what he would see, and that's why he would say the train would not break. But for the person who is inside the train, that's what he would see. He would see that first the door in the back closes, the train passes through, and then the back door shuts. What's happening here is that 
for the observer who's outside, he sees that both the doors close at the same time. But the person on the train, he sees that both the doors close at different times. This is called simultaneity of relativity. It's, this means that events are not simultaneous. So in one frame of reference, if the events are simultaneous, it may not be simultaneous in another frame of frame of reference. So what's happening here is that if two events happen at present for you, it may not happen at the same time for someone else. It may happen in the future or in the past. So it's like someone's future may be, your, may be in your present and maybe your future may be in some else present. So what we see here is that not only just time gets longer and shorter, distances get longer and shorter, but even two events which we see happening at the same time don't happen at the same time. Time is not the way we see it. And that's proved by Einstein's special theory of relativity. Thank you.